Hello and welcome to podcast number eight from the self-publishing formula live from the London Book Fair. Two writers, one just starting out, the other a bestseller. Join James Blatch and Mark Dawson and their amazing guests as they discuss how you can make a living telling stories. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Here we are for the second episode of the podcast on location uh, from the London Book Fair. This is a huge, important book fair. It's held in Olympia in West London. Uh, Mark and I have come down onto the ground floor of the Grand Hall. Now, this is uh, the ancient building we now know. We do. Do you remember the year? 1880-something. Eight? Six. Six. Two years out, but it probably <laughs> took two years to build it. Um, and we are, we, we are amongst the old trad tradition, uh, traditional publishers, and I've dragged you down here reluctantly. We're standing around, I suppose a bit like... I don't know. It's very intellectual. There's lots of um, people looking quite eccentric wandering around. Uh, red trousers, very much on view. Um, a few long lunches will have taken place over the last couple of days. And uh, do you feel in place here or out of place here? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I feel more comfortable upstairs in the, uh, with the uh, other indie authors, obviously. But this is, it's all about books and stories. Um, print is just a delivery mechanism. Uh, it's just the same as, as digital. So that's, that's what I'm telling myself. It's all about the stories. Yes, it, is, yeah, all, it yeah. is obviously all about stories. I just wondered if you felt like Henry Ford visiting a stable block. <laughs> yeah, good one, yeah, exactly. Okay, so th- in this episode of the podcast, we had a good, a good few chats, and we've got a lot of people to get through in this, this episode. So what we're going to do is keep it really focused uh, on things that we think are going to be useful, as if you had come to the London Book Fair, the sort of conversations that perhaps you would have had as an aspiring author. And uh, we've talked to people who do different services, some services you will have heard of, some you may not have thought about. Um, We're going to talk to an aggregator, and if you don't know what that means, don't worry, I didn't really understand it before the chat. We're going to talk to a couple of guys who've created a service that you can use online, and it's kind of a market forum for finding things like an editor and other services for authors. And we're going to talk to somebody who talks in a language that sounds a little bit like traditional publishing and something you may not have thought of, which is networking having conversations with publishers even and agents and how you do that and why it's still important to do that regardless of what your long-term aims are. Um, All good stuff and we're going to get going, aren't we Mark, with uh, Draft to Digital, an aggregator um, and Dan Wood and this is a service that you have personally used. Yeah, I've been using Draft to Digital for ages and ages and they're really, really good, great way to get um, books into different platforms. You might not otherwise, otherwise be able to get to yourself uh, also, just very easy. It makes things nice and simple, you know. Because at the end of the day, what do we want to be doing? Want to be writing? Don't really want to be wrestling with metadata. So, um, yeah, I'm a big fan of, of Draft Digital. Hi, I'm Dan Wood from. Uh, I'm the director of author relations at Draft Digital. So, the uninitiated, explain to me. I know it's an aggregator. Just yeah. explain to me in words of one syllable what you do. So we help authors publish worldwide. Uh, We do conversion of Word documents if they don't have the digital files they need. So we can convert those into all the different files like Mobis and EPUBs. And then we can help them distribute and manage their titles. Uh, We go to iBooks, Kobo, Barnes & Noble. Uh, We help with print-on-demand at CreateSpace. We go to a lot of like little, uh, not necessarily little, but national retailers like Tolino, uh, which is a German alliance of bookstores. So we can get your books into the German e-retailers as well. So it's, uh, formatting is a different thing. So you'd expect the Word document to have been formatted into chapters. Or is this something you take as well? Our technology handles uh, the formatting piece of it. So as long as you followed a consistent like chapter one, chapter two, our software does all the rest. I could step in at that point. I, mean, I, I, I use Draft Digital to format my um, my Word documents into into some formats that I send out to my advanced readers, and it's, it's a really smooth process, very easy to use, and it produces a lovely document at the end of the day. And you, you get it into stores. Yes. Uh-huh. So, so this is more than just a technical job of, um, of getting it acceptable for a store, but you are the person who places it there. And Mark was telling me before we started the interview that some reach you have, an author wouldn't have without you. Yes, uh, we do merchandising with our retailers. So we look at the books that are doing well, we let the retailers merchandisers know, and we nominate the books for promotions. They, all of the retailers have like ongoing promotional areas, like a free first and serious area at some of them. Uh, others do like daily deals, and so we nominate books for those deals. And, and kind of you know, practically what that meant for me, um, Dan and, and the team put one of my books into a promotion at Barnes & Noble, and that hit number one in the store. So that wouldn't be something that I wouldn't have been able to do myself, and 
So I owe Dan about six beers probably <laughs> by this stage. It's counting. But is the, the formatting and the creating the Moby and stuff is presumably, if you're technically minded and you've got the gift and the time, is something you could do yourself? Yes, we accept EPUBs. So people bring us their own EPUB all the time. Uh, some of them do it themselves. Some of them have uh, their own formatters that they hire and work with. Uh, we also do some neat stuff with uh, automating in matter. And so we can, with either the Word document or EPUBs now, uh, generate like your also buy page if an author wants us to. But which the also buy page is like at the end of your book, uh, links to all of your other books. And the way we do it is we can do that so we can generate a link for the retailer, specific to the retailer. So the EPUB that we send to Apple is going to have Apple links. The one that we send to Barnes Noble is going to have Barnes Noble links. So their readers can go on that platform and click once and buy the book. Right. Um, it's something, if you do it yourself as an author, that can take hours. It's a pain. It's a big pain. It's a, it's a really helpful service. And um, how much does all this cost an author? Uh, so we have no, uh, no upfront fees. We have no hidden fees. It's all based on listing with us. So as long as you list a book with us, we get about 10% of retail list price on each sale. Um, author retains all of the rights, and so uh, you can list or delist from our service at any time. So that's 10% of the sales from your site your yeah. list F from uh, wherever we uh, distribute it to okay. Okay. and so uh, that ends up being at all of our our current contracts with everyone the author makes a, right around 60 percent of the retail list price on every sale and that includes below 299 and above 999 so some authors can make more money uh, going through us than going direct uh, for selling like box sets or when they have a book bub for 99 cents for instance so Sure. Okay, so a couple of questions then. How's it going? Going great. We, uh, we're up to 80,000 books that we distribute. Um, we work with about 20,000 authors. Um, we had, uh, we started like keeping track of all the people who are hitting like the USA Today or New York Times bestseller list. In 2015, we had 56 books hit the New York Times bestseller list. Uh, so far, we've had like 39 books hit the USA Today list this year including Mark's, Mark Dawson. Mark's pointing at <laughs> yes. himself, modestly. Yeah, so that's very exciting. We get to work with some really high-end authors. Um, you know, we're continuing to build tools and try to open up new, like, you know, new uh, sales channels. And so that's one of the big reasons we came here to London Book Fair is to meet new international uh, bookstores. And so you're doing great by the sounds of it. I mean, say 80,000 books, yes. 20,000 authors, and presumably growing. Yeah, and, uh, we opened about three years ago. We're just over three years old. So, so what's your 12-month growth? Do you remember what you were 12 months ago? Um, I don't. I know, I'll, put, I'll put you on the spot I, I, I know we doubled uh, from 2014 to the end of 2015. Okay. Um, I think... We've been growing about 100 books a day and about 10 authors a day. So we, we have been growing significantly. I just haven't calculated it. Like yeah, yeah. So it's, doubling is probably yes. a, an annual thing, I would imagine, at the moment. Um, and then you're in a good place, really, to, to get a bird's eye view of the industry, of the self-pub exactly. industry. I mean, we're standing at London Book Fair, one of the biggest book fairs in the world, still kind of dominated by a lot of traditional media. It but but the where, where you're looking out, this is, I guess, the more vibrant part. It, it's amazing. I have the greatest job in the world because I get to go around all these conferences and meet with authors and you know romance authors are so savvy right now and they're doing so many things uh, you know I get to meet a lot of authors who are taking uh, your course on Facebook ads uh, you know authors are really starting to figure out the marketing angle of all this because you know you want the first thing you want to do is make sure you've got good books and you have a lot of them but then after that you have to start working on the marketing piece and authors are getting better and better at that. Yeah, that's certainly what we're noticing as well. So it sounds like Dan's got a, a fantastic uh, position in a, in a growing market. Yeah, it's a, I remember very well seeing a, a, a post on Cables from Aaron Pogue, who was, yes. uh, was involved in establishing the company three or four years ago, and, and they've grown so fast. I, I, I'm a big fan of Darth Digital. They've, Dan's been great, um, and his team have helped me a lot with, with getting things done. So, you know, I am, I'm a, one, of, one, of their, one of their fanboys. Yeah, and uh, finally, Dan, because obviously the podcast is for lots of people who are starting out or some people quite advanced, but what sort of tips and secrets do you have from the industry? What could you, you say to an author to get this part of things right? So, Apart from obviously use. Yeah. <laughs> draft uh, 
on the draft to digital angle, we do have like a phone number, a toll free number, so anyone can call us when they have questions instead of you know like spending a lot of time having to research it. For new authors, I tell them worry about writing a few books first, write in series. I, you know, I would encourage people to get to about three books before they really spend a lot of time on marketing or trying to get promoted uh, because you're going to give yourself a much better chance if you've got books for uh, readers to move on to. And readers now have so many options. If you don't have something there for them to buy next, uh, you know, they're just going to forget about you. Uh, I would capture emails from the very beginning. No matter who you are as an author, set up an email list, capture, you know, just let people opt in so you can tell, uh, you as an author can tell the reader uh, that you've got a new book and you'll be able to use that later for some of the marketing pieces. Uh, use pre-orders, uh, Apple, Barnes & Noble, Kobo, I'll let you set up pre-orders. Uh, I highly recommend them. Uh, Amazon lets you do pre-orders now as well. Uh, some people don't like that because they kind of uh, split the rank over time. Uh, but for everywhere else, I would use pre-orders so people can always buy your next book. Um, those are pretty much the main things. Maybe uh, on the cover front, always make sure your cover is genre appropriate. Uh, I see a lot of authors come with these great, beautiful covers, but they don't really tell you what genre it is. And it's so important that your cover promises the reader what it's, what it's about. And so it needs to look like the other covers in this genre, but stand out a little bit. We've got a podcast on covers coming up, but it's something I think about is the time you spend looking at a cover in the electronic world is a blink of an eye. Yes. So if it doesn't tell that story, you're quite right, straight away you've lost yeah. an opportunity. And it's got to look good on like thumbnails because yeah. a lot of covers are designed Too to look detail. beautiful as they printed a book. But when, you ha- when you're just looking at like a little inch by inch, yeah. uh, you can't tell what it says. Like You want it to pop as a thumbnail. So. Yeah, great advice, Dan. Thank you very much. And where are you off to next? Back to Oklahoma? Uh, back to Oklahoma, then Chicago, then a little everywhere else. So, <laughs> yeah, I got a couple of weeks at home now. So, Good. I'm excited. You enjoyed that. Nice to speak to you. Thank you. Downward draft to digital. Really nice guy, and very much in the type of mold of the new businesses that exist in the digital space that just talk and feel different from the old traditional businesses yeah just a all-around nice guy with probably the best beard at the book fair yeah he had a good beard there's no doubt about that um we are actually on a stairway i do love olympia i have to say it's a very atmospheric uh, building huge cavernous hall we're in as i said reminiscent of a a railway shed and built around the same times as the the great london terminals We've got Bloomsbury Books just uh, away to our left, a GMC Publications. We've got quite a few of the uh, old names and some print people as well. I mean, all sorts of... Um, uh, and countries represented here. I noticed some stands. So France and I think Holland are here as well. They take a stand and they give some slots to up-and-coming uh, businesses in their own zone. I know the UK does that abroad as well. So a yeah, traditional fair, I suppose, in many senses. But we're still going to focus on the emerging area of this whole publishing industry and the next couple of guys we're talking to again very entrepreneurial uh, very focused on helping and servicing uh, particularly authors who are in the digital space and how did you get to know the Reedsy pair? Uh, they reached out to me I think when they started they set the company up they, they looked at a few um, authors who might be able to do some outreach for them um, and yeah, Ricardo and Emmanuel, both are really smart young guys. Uh, they're winning awards for the services they're, they're providing with Reads. It's a great platform, very exciting, um, and really useful for, for authors if you're looking for editors or other creative professionals to help you get your, your book in ship shape and ready for sale. Okay, and if you don't know what Reads is, they do a good job of explaining uh, how the company works and how it can offer its services to you. Okay, Emmanuel Nataf and Ricardo Fayet and Mark Dawson is still here with another little part, another little corner of the London Book Fair. Um, you're the Reedsy guys. It's, quite diff- it's actually quite difficult to say. It is difficult to say. That's why we picked only, the name. Only for yeah. you, James. Only for me. So tell us a little bit about where you started and where you're going. Uh, yeah, no, so we started a couple of years ago and our goal was really to create kind of a marketplace for publishing professionals. Uh, so that authors could find really the perfect editor, the perfect designer, or publicist, marketer for their needs, and really kind of separate the good people in the industry from the wannabe editors, wannabe designers who are not that good and who are going to uh, maybe be a bit cheaper uh, in their services for authors, but in the end, authors are not going to see the, the value because they're not going to sell their books. So that's 
kind of the whole vision uh, behind Reedsy. And now we have 400 professionals on our marketplace that we handpicked out of over 10,000 applicants because people now just want to apply to be listed on Reedsy because they know they're going to get work. So we do a lot of selection and uh, we pick the, the really good people and now have, uh, I think, 15,000 authors also signed up uh, who brews the marketplace. Okay, so Emmanuel, a good start. I mean, you've had, to, you've had a lot of applications, you've got a good, vibrant marketplace now. And I guess you're tapping into the fact that when people start writing a book, they literally know nothing about that side of things. I mean, I'm writing a book, I have no idea where I'm going to go for an editor, apart from obviously, I, da- I kind of do know where I'm going to go now, but people don't generally, do they? Yeah, so that's why we like to help them via our blog, first of all. So we publish a lot of interesting educating, educational content that they can you know, go through about editing, design, marketing, etc. And also, when you create a Ritzy account, there's always that help button in the top bar that you can use. And someone on the team at Ritzy can then respond to you um, regarding any questions you may, you may have regarding the self-publishing process. And we know in digital businesses that niche works. So, I mean, there are quite a few. There's People Per Hour and, and Fiverr. And, yeah. and in my, my industry, in creative industries, we use those quite a lot. They're quite broad in general, but you've really created something that's of value because it works to a specific audience. Yeah, definitely. And I think it works particularly well in this niche because the people we have on Reach are not, cannot be on Fiverr and other marketplaces like that because it's marketplaces that are very competitive in terms of bidding and prices where you post a project and 10, 20 people are going to bid on it. And usually you're going to go for the cheaper one. And so real professionals are going to be competing against, as I said, wannabe freelancers. And they're going to lose every time because the other ones are going to be cheaper. So they're going to leave those marketplaces. And that's that's why when we started Reedsy, we talked to a few editors and they told me, ah, they told us, ah, we were number one on Elance and we left Elance because it didn't work for us anymore. We were getting... constantly outbid by, by cheaper people who are not as professional and as experienced. So that's the kind of people that ended up signing up first on Reedsy and, um, and that's why we're not really so directly competing with uh, marketplaces like Fiverr. And so how do you, Emmanuel, ensure that, because that, if, if your USP here is that there's a quality professional yeah. at the end of the bid here, not just some rank amateur in his bedroom or her bedroom, how do you guarantee that's going to continue to be the case? Yeah, so uh, we go through a curation process at Reedsy. So as Ricardo said, we have hundreds of, uh, of applications every week to be listed on the marketplace. Um, what's interesting is we get full profiles from our professionals and then we go through those profiles, their portfolios, uh, previous work experience, and then we decide whether they would make sense for our marketplace or not. And you deal, I suppose, with every business, there's going to be occasional knockbacks, so you're quickly to respond if I had a bad experience with somebody from your site, there's a way of you dealing with that? Yeah, so that never happens, but there's a, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> there's a satisfaction guarantee on Reedsy, so whenever that might happen, we are happy to offer a refund or anything like that, because as I said, it's going to happen only a very few times, and we can take the head, and we're happy to take the head, because we don't want our authors to have a bad experience. In the end, it's our authors. Really. Great. Well, we were talking just earlier about how many little industries have been spawned, enabled because of the internet and the, the digital world that we live in. And this is a great example, isn't it, Mark? Yeah, I've been a big fan of Reedsy right from the start. So I've known Ricardo and Emmanuel for a couple of years now, um, and it's exactly the kind of the kind of thing that was needed. I mean, I'm asked today just at LBF, two people have asked me for editors, and I've referred them both to, to Reedsy because I know they'll get a really good a good service there. So. You know, I think you guys are doing a great job and, you know, keep doing it. Thank you, Mark. You're listening to the Self-Publishing Formula podcast with James Blatch and Mark Dawson. We are on location at the London Book Fair in West London. Uh, And Mark, we're now going to talk about networking, which I suppose is sort of the purpose of coming to a conference like this. But I think... It's something that doesn't necessarily come naturally to new authors in the digital space. No, and authors by disposition tend to be quite introverted. Um, it's not something that I was always very good at doing either, so it is, but it is important to reach out and meet, meet people uh, at places like this. So, I mean, for example, 10 minutes ago I had a half an hour chat with the guys from BookBub, um, which was, was great. Obviously, that could be quite important for, for my career. Obviously, BookBub is, is great, so it's excellent to, to reach out and make connections with those people. There's still nothing um, 
there's no real substitute for, for pressing the flesh or, or that kind of thing. It's all fine to send emails and, and, and talk on the phone, but there's nothing quite like having a face-to-face -face conversation. So, um, yeah, Justine Solomons, uh, who, who runs Bite the Book, um, is probably one of the, uh, the best connected uh, people that I know in publishing in London. She seems to know everybody. Um, well, she said you know everybody as well. But she was just being nice. But she, uh, she, I think, well, between us, maybe we, we, we're pretty well connected. So, but she is, she's really excellent at, at, at putting herself out there and meeting new people. So it was, um, it was, really, it was really great to see her yesterday. And I should explain uh, for listeners uh, not in the UK, not familiar with a restaurant called The Ivy. It's a very famous celebrity haunt. It's famous for its lunches rather than dinner. I've been there a couple of times. We used to work quite close by, didn't we, Mark, together? And um, I've never failed to be impressed by the other people you recognise sitting at tables uh, across the way in there. It's particularly famous in literary circles because... The whole publishing world is famous for its long, liquid lunches, and that's very much the old industry, but guess where we met Justine Solomons? They've got a pop-up version of the Ivy here at the London Book Fair. OK, so Bite the Book was initially set up to help authors get published and to meet agents and publishers, or to help them publish however they wanted to publish. They wanted to publish independently, for them to have the right people around them to do it. And then later on I realised the publishers didn't really understand technology and I wanted to bring them in the network as well. So now we educate the whole industry and authors what's happening in technology. And the third thing we do is we connect people with each other and other industries that can use their content. And we do that primarily by having regular events and we run those events at very nice places. So, well, I should say we're sitting in the Ivy. Yes, yes. So we started off in the Ivy. Um, we've run events there, we run events at the Groucho and we're just about to start a series of events at the Café Royal. Okay. So Byte, by the way, is spelled B-Y-T-E, so people understand that there's the digital foundation to the company. And I was thinking that one of the aspects of indie publishing is it's quite an isolated existence and quite an isolated yeah. industry, whereas the old publishing industry, well, here we are sitting in the Ivy, this is quite old publishing, everyone meeting all the time. So I guess that's the gap you're trying to plug. Yeah, I want, I want to help authors become more literate in the publishing industry and to know that they've got choices. I think there is a... Um, misconception that you need to get an agent and a publisher and then everything's done and, and your book's going to be sold in, in millions of copies and, and, and that's the end of the journey and that is a way that some authors can publish and they can do very well but if you're a mid-list author you're often going to be neglected by a, a big publishing house and so you uh, so you need to think about your your marketing strategy and um, I think independent authors like Mark have done it incredibly well um, understanding how to market themselves. One of the issues that the big publishing houses have is that they publish a lot of books and, and so you're just one author or one book in, in a mountain of books and they don't have enough people to do that. You're, as um, an author, you're a much better place to market yourself and so I want to empower authors to be able to do that but I'm not dissing the traditional publishing industry and I think for some authors that is the right road, route to go you might only like writing and you might be terrified of social media um, so so that can work for you but if you, often people that come to bite the book are self actualizing so as I said we have events at very nice clubs and lots of the members of those clubs to come to our events and They've done brilliantly in their careers, they, they, but they, they might be journalists, but you were a lawyer before um, you started publishing. And, and you've done really well, and, and you've got a lot of skills that you can offer the publishing industry and, and of your books. And, and, and one of the other issues with the pub I sound like I'm slagging off the publishing industry, I love the publishing yeah. industry, it's amazing. But it's a bit introspective, and you just have a lot of publishers talking to each other about what they're doing, and they don't, they might not have ever worked in other industries. And, and there's, you know, there's a lot of other industries that understand consumers a lot better. And marketing, different ways of marketing, digital marketing. You know, it's, I, I first met Justine when I did a talk with Amazon at a Byte event. And I don't remember what the I can't remember exactly what the title of the talk was, but it was we the ended author's up journey, that's I right think. the author's yeah, journey, yeah, and yeah. we ended up talking about things like mailing lists and advertising and different ways of doing things that were perhaps alien to some of the um, the, the people there. I'm not I'm not dissing the traditional industry either, but there's there's definitely an exchange of ideas that can take place at meetings like that, and everyone benefits. I think so. I think so. And one of the interesting things that Mark did at that talk was talk about Facebook. And I had heard, repeatedly heard from publishers, that Facebook doesn't work for marketing. 
your books and and bec- and they're all on Twitter and they're all talking to Twitter. They're only really talking to themselves. Mm-hmm. Most people aren't mm-hmm. using Twitter. Twitter's an echo chamber, basically. Yeah, yeah. Well, for yeah. organic. So yeah. I mean, we, we have we've had some damages yeah. with advertising, paid advertising with Twitter, and we've got that yeah. to work. Yeah, it we can don't. it can work, but but most people are on Facebook. Yeah. And um, you've done very well. Not even organic Facebook, because that even that the algorithms have now changed to really yes, preference yeah, paid yeah, advertising. Yeah, yeah. And like you, um, lost my name. Another yeah. example of someone yeah, that's great, come uh, from outside the industry. So lost my name. Asi Sharabi's background is in advertising, and has sold millions of copies of children's books yeah. specific to their name. And he's done that through Facebook so, advertising. To my actually, I've, and I have one. Um, I didn't know you knew him. Yeah, yeah. He's spoken at Bite the Book. Oh, there he's we go. From the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. See, so, I told you, Justine is the most well-connected yes. woman in the <laughs> Everyone. Um, so some of that resonated, I was thinking, from your backstory. You certainly had that experience with traditional publishing. And let's once again say we're not slagging off. It's about how the two are going to go forward together. But your early experience with trad publishing was quite dispiriting, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. A bit. Everyone knows my, my, my experience there. It was, it was, marketing was, was minimal, at least visibly. I didn't see that much. And I have much more fun these days. And it's more effective. As you said, Justine, that it's... it's I'm not lost amid a big catalogue of books that gets attention spread among them from my books. They're, they're, I am only marketing my books, and I am 100 of the attention. I'm invested in them because they're my, yes. my that's my business. Um, so it's it, I, I can be more effective that way. Uh, the thing about technology and social media is that it, it it puts the author and the consumer, the reader, much closer together. Yeah. And Amazon have done brilliantly to um, help that distribution channel. And so when you're talking, about, you're talking directly to the authors. No one's t- telling you to do that. You're doing it genuinely. Yeah. I follow you on Facebook. You're, te- you're telling me about your life. You're telling me about you know, writing as an incidental part of that. Yeah. And, and, I, and I feel invested in you. Exactly. And therefore I want to read your books and I feel like I know you. Um, whereas if you're being mediated by a publisher or an agent or someone else, then, then there's a distance. And there's, there's people taking chunks out of the value chain. Yeah. Yeah. So, Justin, how much of your work or your role do you do you see as educating traditional media? Because it still does seem to be a them and us feel, certainly here in LBF. Um, I've so I set up Bite the Book four years ago. Um, my background is in technology; it's not in publishing. So I'm a bit of an interloper. I, I like reading and I, like, I love writing. So that's where I came from. Um, I like to think uh, we we agitate for change a bit Mm -hmm. and um, so the consultancy business we've set up publishers want to meet us and find out what's new in tech so there is an appetite for it the problem is there's not much revenue in traditional publishing I think there's much more revenue actually in independent publishing um, and and self-published authors so so they're limited a little bit by their budgets Um, but the good thing about Byte Book is that we have a regular debate every month so rather than having a big conference that you have to pay £400 to go to, um, Bite the Book events, people pay £99 a year to join or they can just come to a single event for £20 and they can get involved in the debate um, and meet people from outside the industry and on the nice bar events sometimes we're the highest rated um, hashtag in London. So I think we're actually... I'm a little person. <laughs> I set up a small company but it's growing and I, I think at least I'm trying to make a change. And, and you've got a yeah. list of the events uh, we can see in front of us. I can see Frankfurt, so largely in London, aren't they? But well, yeah, well they're largely in London, um, but also members of Bite the Book can get free, get in free to London Book Fair. I've just come back from Bologna, they can get in free to Bologna. I've got a ticket allocation for Frankfurt Book Fair as well. Um, and I've been invited out to Berlin soon to run an event there. So we're starting to become more international, and there are people that are interested in partnering with us all over. But at the moment, yes, at the moment we're primarily focused in London. I've also run events in the US and New York. Okay. One final, sort of final area I want to talk about is um, quite a lot of the students who listen to this podcast are fairly advanced. I mean, right. they get it, they understand yes, advertising, yeah, yeah. social media, yeah. the rest of it. One of their worries is that everyone's going to discover the secret. And one of the things that we often say to them is there are hundreds of thousands of other authors. And I don't know what your view on this is. What sort of percentage of the people writing books really understand the digital side of things? I I, I think um, lots of people that write spike in English. 
and have um, limitations when it comes to technology. That's not the thing they want to do. Lisa Jewell spoke at one of our events and she says, I was, I'm just a writer that sits in my garret and I don't, I don't really want to get involved in social media. She's, she's been pushed to. I think um, anything you can do makes you better than most authors. M- most authors want to write and actually maybe that's fine but it, and, and you can be that kind of author just try and make friends with somebody that's a bit more marketing like I'm I like writing but actually I like marketing more I like networking so make friends with people like me or, or bite the book or so, people like Mark so you don't actually. have to do very much to elevate yourself above no, and then I, I mean I had there was a woman that spoke on my panel yesterday in the author HQ and she um, is a retired facilities manager from Yorkshire and she has written she started writing in 2012 she wrote her first book um, and didn't really know what she was doing put it up on Amazon and went to number one she's written nine books now and and I asked her about social media and whether she used social media she said I don't really, didn't really understand it but actually what I do every morning I do it for an hour and, and then the rest of the day I write and I, and I think um, having it, putting it in its place and actually you're an advantage for somebody who's completely addicted to social media and doing it all the time so so I mean, I'm sure you, Mark, you, you, you allot time for your social media, so you've yeah. got time to write. Yeah, mornings, I'm creative in the morning, so I tend to do the, the, the writing in the morning. When your energy is I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll kind of have a bit of lunch, go for a run, and then in the afternoon I'll switch over to the, kind of the other part of my brain and do the marketing, promotion, social media, emails, all, all that kind of other stuff. But, you know, it's complimentary. You can't, it's difficult to be successful if you're only good at one thing. I think you need... At least an affinity for, for both. But, but I think one of the things, one of the reasons why Bite the Book has done well is because I like to cooperate with people. And you can either see people as your um, competitor or you can you can see them as allies. That, so a very Notting Hill, um, Notting Hill Press collaborated, a group of um, independent authors collaborated and helped each other. Yeah. And, I, yeah. and, and you, you talk very much about how you've worked with other people as well too, and we've tried to work together as well. So... It's you can, I, I, I just think it's better to try and help each other yeah. and, and to change the market together. And don't worry if someone else is doing something similar. Try, try working with them first. Yeah, okay, you know? I agree. Absolutely, collaboration runs through us, doesn't it? How we operate as well. And it's more fun. And the more yes. life, from, from your life point of view, it's a much more enjoyable thing than being spiteful and nasty and hoping other people fail, which seems to yeah. be a very yeah. negative way of living. Although lots of industries do work like that. Is someone, so Co-opetition. Yeah, Co-opetition. Yeah, I like that. Co-opetition. Good word. And, and, and you, you know, the, 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 uh, it's something of the ships in the harbour. If you raise the tide, then all the ships come up. Side, if boats, no one can see our hands yeah. rising yeah. here while we're talking. But Final question, Justine. Yeah. Top tips then for somebody for free okay, on yes. this occasion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, new authors. I think Perhaps don't quite understand it. What should they be doing? What are the first things they should be doing? Um, I think they shouldn't be afraid of the publishing industry. They're just people. Agents and publishers aren't gods. They are, they, they, they're real and um, try and get out and meet people and maybe when you go out and meet people the first thing you say shouldn't be here's my book but try and get to know them and um, you know places like Bite the Book or, or following tips that Mark's doing just, just try and get involved in the world e- either in the real world going to events or by getting involved in social media you're very hands-on, I imagine, with this in this business. Yes, is there yeah. something you would ever take to the States? I'd like to, yeah, very much, very much. And I had a meeting actually yesterday with somebody that was interested in doing it there. And I've tried tried to do it there. I think um, we are behind the States in, um, in, in independent publishing. Um, but they still... We do co-op- cooperation better here. You know, mm. and, and I, you know, I set up by the book, I had this idea of hub publishing. People... When you, when you self-publish, you don't publish on your own. You publish with a group of people around you. So getting the right team around you and having people that support you. And I, and I, I think that's something very much that we can educate others about. I felt very, uh, very sort of um, traditional publishing there, sitting in the ivy, chatting to Justine, a great networker. But uh, it is important, and she's absolutely right. You can do so much sitting behind your keyboard, but at some point... There's such a, a, a difference when you've had a conversation with someone. I think Justine's important point she made is you have a chat with an agent and with a publisher, but not with a view to them signing you. Just have a chat with them and find out what works for them, what they're doing, what the latest things are. And then in the longer term, you can start to think about when's the appropriate time for you to go and talk to them more professionally. 
and of course at which point hopefully you've got a bit of an idea of how much you can generate by yourself and therefore how you can negotiate. Yeah, exactly. It's all about building up your, your, your network so that when you're ready and you, you need something, there's someone you, uh, you can reach out to because you've met them at something like this or you know, you've met them here and then you've had a longer conversation somewhere else. It's just building, building your network, building your connection so that you're ready to take advantage when, when you need to. There are lots of familiar, friendly faces uh, in the indie publishing world here at London Book Fair and Mark spent some time talking to people he's met for the first time but we couldn't resist saying hello to our friend Joanna Penn who's such a star uh, for lots of people uh, in this particular digital space. So we caught up with Joe. We're standing in front of the children's book section and you have to walk all the way through the children's book section which is colourful and lovely by the way to find the uh, author HQ and where the indie authors hang out and that's where we caught up with Joe. Here we are at the LBF with our friend Joanna Penn. Hello, Joe. How are you? Hello, James. I'm good. How are you? Yeah, this is the first time we've met in the flesh. It is. It's quite indeed. exciting. It we've is very exciting. Virtually met a lot and spoken a lot. Um, you've got a couple of sessions. I know you've done panels. We saw you last night looking a little bit like Madonna with the old headset microphone. Um, what have you been doing? Well, I was speaking on the business of writing. So uh, I did. It was a really packed session. I was really pleased because sometimes you get a lot of first time authors here who don't want to talk about the business side. But I actually did a pretty good session on how to make a living with your writing. So talking about the importance of covers, the importance of editors, the importance of series, uh, lots of different tips and also products, how to turn one book into multiple products. And uh, that session was sponsored by Kobo, uh, of course, who we, we you love. Had, you had Mark next to you? Yeah, Mark Lefebvre was there. And uh, so it was really good, I think, to always talk about multiple countries, multiple languages, and of course, you know, Kobo take us wider. I mean, we all love Amazon, but I think it's really important also to think about wider options for other countries. So, yeah, I guess I'm at the fair. I've been coming to the fair for five years now. So it's been nice to see the sessions expand into more indie topics, I think, because sometimes it can be a bit basic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so getting in a little bit more into the detail of stuff. And do you find that's because the audience is better educated now? They're coming here better equipped? I think so. I mean, there are some people that I've been meeting here, you know, for the last five years. Uh, but there are always new people, new authors. So of the talk yesterday, there were probably maybe a, a quarter were first-time authors, like yourself, right? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. First-time novelists. And, but, but what's nice, I think, is for them, and I know you do, think about this from even right now when you're still writing, you're actually thinking about how can I do this sustainably for the long term? And that, I think, is a mindset shift because authors traditionally have not actually thought that much about how, we, how we're how we going to make an income with this or perhaps haven't even considered that there might be a long-term business as a writer. So that I think that's why it's exciting. Um, I, I definitely got on my hobby horse a bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you said to me you were a bit worried that you may have gone on a bit, but I, I don't I, think so. Yeah, I, well, I think I just get so excited and I think many authors don't realise that what you're potentially signing over to a publisher are intellectual property assets that can make you money for your whole life and 70 years after you die. And I, I've just been talking to, to a publisher just before our chat here, and we were talking about how advances have really stratified at the moment. So we've heard of a multi-seven-figure deal that's been done yesterday, and then, but that's one in a I don't know, one in a hundred thousand authors, or I don't even know the figure, but it very, very, very rare. And then the other end of the scale, so for one author to get that big of an advance, the other end of the scale, a lot of authors are getting two grand, five grand advances. And to me, it's like, I'm sorry, if you self-publish... It's a month's income. Yeah, it's a, potentially, but even if, even if you're making 50 pounds a month, from your self-published book you're still going to make that money back in a couple of years it's not a lifetime plus 70 yes, exactly yeah. so I think when you actually look at the longer term money and do some basic sums the the income that people are looking at as an author the money side of being published at the moment is becoming quite desperate now would I accept a multi seven figure deal oh yes and I'm sure you would <laughs> absolutely it's still waiting exactly but the number of people getting that type of thing is going to be very, very small. So then on the other side, I, I almost think that indie is the new mid-list. Yeah. And you can make better money as a mid-list indie than you can as a mid-list traditionally published author, basically. Yeah. And so um, do you feel that... I mean, we're here in the Author HQ and you're talking to an audience that's better educated and understanding that I'm writing a book doesn't really work in the same way. I'm thinking about a career. So where's your third book, by the way? It should be in your head already. And all that stuff. But out there, and it is literally physically out there, we're kind of yes. shunted to one end here, is this whole traditional publishing industry with their headline deals. 
Uh, do they get it yet? I mean, how's your feeling now? Well, I think, I think the funny thing is that, you know, we have this year, last year we were in the digital area, the tech, technical area, which I thought was great. Actually, that's where we should be. And now we're right at the back, behind the, behind the children's publishing area, which I think says something about the way we're being viewed this year. Um, authors are not central to the London Book Fair. And, and actually, this year, I almost feel that we, as authors, might have moved on. So actually, perhaps this isn't the right place for us to be. I haven't felt it before. I felt like, no, we should be here stamping ourselves on the industry. But now I actually feel like, uh, and Joe Comrath has said it's a shadow industry, I actually feel like I'm quite proud of that. I like the shadow. I like the deviant. I like the independence. The delinquent nephew. So I described it on social media today. So what it feels like. Yeah. And do we want to be with the suits in the big room? No, we don't have to be. It used to be that we were like, oh, but actually we want to be you. But now I feel like we've got a movement. We've got, you know, we're proud of being indie. You know, I want to wear the hash proud to be indie, you know, T-shirt. And so I don't know. I don't feel left out. I feel that we've got our own thing going on. But it's, if I was to take a wider view that was not just from an indie point of view, I look at that industry in the same way that you looked at HMV and Virgin Music when the music revolution was happening. And HMV could be the biggest streaming music service on the planet. And HMV instead, who? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and now we're talking about names, well, the world's longest river next to us, uh, mm. that we hadn't heard of 15 years ago that have dominated that industry. And I just think, are they really rearranging the chairs as they head towards the iceberg and it's still not really dawning? And the fact that I've come here and seen us shunted here has made me a little bit dispirited and thinking, do you know what, get on with it and we'll get on with our thing. Exactly, I think that's true. What I also think is what's happening with indies. I've been meeting some other indies who've been around a long time. A lot of indies are starting their own publishing companies. And this makes me laugh because the outsider will always become the mainstream eventually. So what, And I think what we're going to see in the next five years, this is my, my pick for the mm-hmm. next five years, so what, what are we, 2016, so by, by 2020, What you're going to see is some of the biggest indie authors who are starting publishing companies will be bought by the big name publishers. If they've survived that long. Yeah, if they survive that long. But I I really expect that's going to happen. Just because that's what happens to publishing companies, they get acquired. So what we have to remember is who is going to be the next outsider? Who's going to be the next kind of revolutionary? Because I feel like we're the indie revolution, as it was a few years ago, is now more mainstream. So, and it's not a surprise anymore. Last question then, um, yeah. we'll move on to the final point. Uh, so obviously it's a podcast and like your podcast um, and you're so well known for your top tips and you are mentioned, you're mentioned in all our other interviews, including by Mark yesterday. What are your key points that you're making to new authors now who come up to you and say, Joe, how do I make it? I still come back to a fundamental question, which is what is your definition of success? because and someone came up to me yesterday and she said oh I've got this offer from a publisher should I take it and I'm like I can't tell you that if your definition of success is to be on the bookshelf at your local bookstore or the high street you know the biggest water stones in the country or you want to win a literary prize you're probably still better off getting a traditional publishing deal but if your goal if your definition of success is to say make a six-figure income which I know you know Mark and I both agree on that you know maybe you do too because you're kind of part of this and that's certainly for me it was always I want to do this for a living and that is my definition of a good living then you're better off going indie so the thing is until an author figures out what they want and they're really reasons for doing it because a lot of authors just want validation am I a good writer these are difficult questions to answer Um, you know and and indies measure it by numbers of books sold numbers of reviews you know emails from readers but some people just want someone to pat them on the back or Bloomsbury on the on the Side yes. of book. or yeah. they want to say to their mum and dad or their yeah. sibling hey look at me I was published by Penguin so I think and there's nothing wrong with ego yeah. this is what's so important so very very important for authors to just stop and think about what their definition of success is because you could be a very unhappy indie if your goal is to have Penguin on the spine right But or, to, or the other way around you could be a very unhappy traditionally published author if you want to make a living so this is the thing so that's my biggest tip what is your definition of success? Thank you, Joe. Do you know there's got to be a gap in the market for a big indie 
conference, hasn't there? If this is no longer feeling like perhaps the place we should be. Well, it's interesting. There are a lot of indie conferences in America. I just uh, came back from the Smarter Artist Summit in Austin, Texas, which was fantastic. I was just talking to Tina Folsom, who's uh, over there, and they were in Hawaii. Um, you know, there's some very big conferences going on now, but they're in America. So, yes, it would be great to have one in Europe. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Sounds like an idea, doesn't it? Joe Penn talking to us a little earlier. Uh, we're still in the children's book section. We're just uh, a couple of, we're a block away in uh, American street talk from the author HQ. And I don't want to get too close because I think the next session is about to start. You're not doing it, are you? No, I've lost my voice. I'm not speaking to anyone today. So, Mark, your LBF, <laughs> just tell me about that before we sign off. And we've got a little treat just at the end, uh, for S, uh, particularly for the SPF community. But your LBF, you've had a busy time, lots of conversations, but you've been on a couple of panels as well. It's just been valuable for you? Yeah, three panels. I did two for Amazon and one for the Alliance of Independent Authors. And, and that was great fun. Um, and as busy as I expected, uh, yesterday was really frantic. So I did the LBF, the, the Amazon talk, and then went back to their stand and didn't really stop talking to authors I don't know, I must be for three hours, I had people waiting to talk to me, sometimes three people in a line waiting to talk, even had people taking selfies with me, which was, that was the first time that's ever happened before. You're and, a rock star and a, in a, indie publishing. <laughs> it's a bit weird. Um, so that, that was great. I mean, I'm losing my voice a bit now. I've had um, meetings, as I said, I met BookBub earlier today. I've got a Radio 4 producer who I'm going to have a chat with um, in five minutes or so. So I'm, I'm ready to go home. I'm, I'm tired. Um, I've, there's been a few uh, late nights, parties and things. So I'm, I'm pretty much done in. Um, Okay, it's, well, been, it's been great. We've got one more item to play out and then we'll say our goodbye. And the last item is, uh, in fact, for me, it's been a highlight of being here is when somebody's tapped us on the shoulder and said, I know who you are. You're Mark Dawson and James Blatch and uh, I listen to the podcast or I'm in your Facebook group or I've done your course in some cases. Mark, and it's been absolutely brilliant to talk to uh, quite a few students uh, who've rocked up and each one of them has an interesting story. You haven't been able to get all of them on tape, um, but there's a couple of really interesting guys, uh, including a, an ex-CID detective who's obviously doing police procedures, a guy called James Sumner who we think is one to watch in the future as well, who's going to have a, a really good career. So uh, here's the best of the little chats of the people who came up to us from the self-publishing formula community. Hi, I'm James Loscombe, uh, self-published author. I've just published a new book called Abomination Yesterday. Abomination Yesterday. Good. Uh, it was published yesterday and it's oh. called Abomination. <laughs> <laughs> Abomination Yesterday. Sounds yeah, like that's a, a good better title. title, yeah. <laughs> Currently I do everything except for the editing and the covers myself. So everything goes on Facebook via me. Uh, everything goes on Twitter via myself. Um, and Reddit as well, I found that to be quite useful. There's a lot of groups on there that um, that sort of have places where you can put books up and people come on there and comment and vote them to the top and hopefully buy your book. I find it very difficult with marketing standalone books. Um, it's very easy to get a lot of sales on one book and then that you're just starting from scratch again on the next book, which is it's frustrating, but um, trying to build up a brand around the author name more than the, um, the titles themselves. I will write when I get the time. I have a sort of a production line method where I'll write first draft stuff in the morning, then in the afternoon I'll be working on um, editing another book, and then in the evening I'll be planning the, the next book. So it's all kind of split up and um, it helps keep it interesting. So you're going to have to find some time in your day for marketing in the future. Yeah, tell me about it. And networking as well. I really need to start uh, meeting more authors, which is why I'm here, actually. <laughs> and I can see, I I'm going to try and read your body language a little bit, that you're less comfortable with the idea of marketing and selling than you are with the writing. And I think that's probably where a lot of writers are. Yeah, massively. Um, I just don't know where to begin. You kind of, you got your Facebook and your Twitter, which I guess aren't really great places to market because most of the people I have following me on Facebook and Twitter are my personal friends rather than... And you're talking organically. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, yeah, so it's kind of, I guess up until sort of a couple of years ago, you didn't really need to do any marketing, but now that's the way the industry's going and you just need to suck it up, I guess, and start actually paying for stuff because that's, that's been a real resistance point for me and, and finding the time to be able to do anything as well is... It's got two, two young children and a wife to keep happy as well, so <laughs> there's not a huge amount of time spare in my day to market. Okay, 
Okay, hi, my name's Daryl Donahue. Uh, I'm a crime fiction writer, ex-detective from Surrey Police, and uh, now I write crime fiction. Excellent. So, a man who really knows what he's writing about when he writes uh, crime novels. Pretty much. That's what the readers say. <laughs> okay, we're excited to meet you because you're a member of the self-publishing formula community. Uh, you've taken Mark's course, mm-hmm. and um, we're happy to say been a bit of a life changer for you. That's right. Um, I was a police officer full time and the dream was always to write uh, as my full time career and thanks to Mark's course I'm able to do that. Oh, that's really good. So you've got a couple of books um, which you're now marketing. That's right. You're a big traveller as well. Yeah, yeah I'm a big traveller. Um, kind of my whole life goal for uh, how I want to live is to travel and to write and um, it looks like from September I'll be doing that. And I spent the last two years uh, living in Korea and teaching English to kind of uh, get some money behind me and travel and to get the time to write. Oh, sounds like a fantastic career <laughs> ambition. Let's talk a little bit about the, um, the novels then. So obviously they're crime procedure, or police procedure, yeah, like you call them. You were a CID detective? Yeah, that's right. I was a CID detective for nine years. So I worked in uh, general crime investigation, also as a sexual offences specialist for a couple of years as well. Okay. Now, without libeling anyone or <laughs> destroying any future court cases, what sort of cases did you deal with? Um, everything from sort of the serious stuff upwards. So as a uniformed officer, you go out to the little... Uh, sticky plaster jobs and do the uh, kind of blue light runs and the exciting Stick, bits. Sticky plaster jobs, what's that mean? <laughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> so, um, yeah, any emergency calls. So, as a uniform officer, you go out to emergency calls, and then if it's a serious investigation, you pass it to CID. Um, so, I would have taken over things like burglaries, robberies, rapes, all the way up to murders, and then been the initial investigative responder on those. So, there's a whole range of serious investigations. Now, there's a lot of crossover between crime novelists and policemen or detectives because I always think a... Um, and I, I used to be a news reporter and I loved covering crime and I loved being with the police about it as well because it's actually a fascinating world. Hence the fact there are so many books and TV series based on this, but you saw all life there. But I think a good detective is someone who is himself fascinated with human behaviour and that's, that's a key link, isn't it, when you're writing? Absolutely. That's, um, you know, that's the real link between my detective work and my detective books is that uh, my readers are fascinated with human behaviour, I'm fascinated by it and I can bring that realistic element of investigation into the fiction world. There's going to be some poetic licence of course, uh, certainly with the pace of investigations, yeah. as anyone who's uh, been a victim of crime may know But are you a stickler a for the detail in terms of procedure? Absolutely, absolutely You couldn't, you couldn't um, do something that you knew, it, you couldn't write a detective doing something you knew in a million years a detective Would, wouldn't do? No, no, no no, no, no. I think as soon as you put your name out there and say, I'm an ex-detective and I'm writing this, yeah. the internet will punish you <laughs> if you're not a complete stickler. And the flip side is that I notice in the Facebook group, the SPF um, uh, Facebook group, you've offered your services Absolutely. for other crime writers. Absolutely. If there's any other crime writers in the group uh, that want uh, soundboard for ideas or want a particular legal point discussed, uh, I'm more than happy to do that. Just get in touch with me via PM or in the group. So let's talk about the marketing side of things. I know you took Nick Stevenson's course. That's right, yep. You've taken 10, Mark's, 10K, readers, 10K Mark's. readers and Mark's Facebook advertising. So where are you in terms of your marketing approach now? Is this Facebook advertising a big part of it? Yes, definitely. Um, between this year and last year, it's a different world. It's, you know, I think like a lot of indie authors, I pressed the publish button and then hid under the duvet waiting <laughs> for something to happen. Um, whereas both Nick and Mark's course let me take control of everything. So I used Permafree on the first book, which has done wonders. Uh, mailing list with MailChimp so uh, the link is in the front of the back of the book with, and at the moment I'm using a uh, 10,000 word short story which is converting quite well for me um, I know in general it's better to use a full novel again and give the best value you can but with me only having two books I'm using that as a stopgap and then as the catalogue grows the second book will become the um, giveaway yeah the giveaway okay. the incentive um, so there's that So and then it's collected on MailChimp And then Mark's Facebook ads course uh, keeps the second book ticking over uh, and it brings in an ROI at the moment of about 150% um, on a book that's $2.99 and $2.50 in the UK. So it's doing well. Um, Again, when the third book comes out, there'll be box sets. There'll be, um, you know, so I'll put a box set advert, get the higher ticket price uh, for the similar spend. So at the moment, it's a case of doing what I can with what I've got. And at every stage, just improve it and improve it and improve it. And write some more, get some more. And write some more, yeah, get that catalogue up. Which is a key part yeah. of it. 
Yeah, well, it's that, that thing I guess uh, lots of indie authors, certainly the ones listening to this podcast, have done where they write the book in the first place, wonder what happens next, and then realise, ah, so success isn't a coincidence. <laughs> yeah, that's it. It is something that you make happen to you yeah. by understanding the business side of things. Absolutely. And Mark's course and, you know, courses like that give you almost like a, a fast track to it. Um, rather than bumbling through, they've bumbled through for us <laughs> so that we yeah. can benefit. And that shrinks the amount of time it takes to get to you know, a place where you can be a full-time writer or whatever your goals are. Uh, my name is James P. Sumner. Um, I'm a self-published author through Amazon. Um, I write mainly in the thriller genre, um, very fast-paced action adventures. Uh, it's, writing's been a lifelong passion of mine and thanks to people like Amazon, Friends Mark, things like that, it's, I'm realising my dream at the moment. So. And you're part of the uh, self-publishing formula community? I am, yeah. Um, I've, I've watched the, the free sort of video course multiple, multiple times. Um, the Facebook group, I've met so many amazing people through that group. Such a, it's such a vast source of knowledge. Um, it is really incredible. And then once the, once the full course opens up, I'll, uh, I'll be handing over my, my money gladly. Well, it's always worth, um, this shouldn't be an advert for the course, so, but that's very kind of you to say that, but certainly for the free course and the Facebook groups, which you know are, are free to join and, and very much part of the community that yeah. we're, we're building. So, um, and there is great to hear that there's value to be had yeah, from absolutely. that. So uh, whereabouts are you based, James, and what's your background? Are you writing full-time now? Is this uh, still trying to transition to full-time? Or? Um, at the moment, I, I'm writing part-time. I have a full-time job. Um, which doesn't afford me a lot of spare time, but any spare time I do, family permitting, um, I I spend it writing. The the goal is to obviously be full-time. I never set out doing this thinking I want a million dollars and Tom Cruise to star in my movie. I just want enough to support my family, and I want to be able to do that by doing something I love. So, um, as I say, I've been writing for just over three years now, and I'm learning more about the industry. I'm learning that it's not just about being a writer, it's about... A business it's a brand that you have to build and uh, it's a lot it's a minefield but I'm enjoying every second of it so it's a totally different world isn't it and it might not be the one that people expect as you say when they start off thinking I'm going to be a writer exactly yeah you don't you I suppose it's I had this kind of glamorized idea of what it was about and it's how I get to sit in coffee shops and look pretentious and and write on the laptop and then when you think about it that's like 10% of what I do is creating new stuff and then you've got to find your editing and your publishing and everything else and it's it's a minefield but it's been such a pleasure learning that industry and as much as I don't necessarily want to be a publisher I want to be a writer you know but it's fun knowing the whole aspect of it and, and doing as much spending as much time as I can doing that and so where are you at the moment obviously you're building a mailing list I guess uh, yeah I've been building a mailing list for just over 12 months which has gone really well um, I have my own Facebook page and website that has, has developed its own little little community um, I was actually I'm, I'm from the north of England I'm from Manchester and uh, I was walking through Manchester Piccadilly station a few months ago and um, I was queuing up for some tickets and I just heard this voice behind me go oh my god it's you and I looked around and there's this woman who works there running towards me and I'm like what, what the hell's going on should I be scared and, yeah and uh, she went oh my god it's, it's James Sumner uh, yeah and she's like I'm such a big fan I've read all your books and I was like really <laughs> How have you done that? And, but she, but she's seen me through the Facebook page, and she, I, I knew who she was. I'd interacted with her quite a lot, and just that was just incredible. And I'm like, am I famous now or something? I, I'm not sure. That was that was great, but something like that makes me sounds cliche to say, but that's why I'm doing it. That kind of interaction, and she was so positive about my books. When all her colleagues came over, she was telling them to go and buy them. And I'm like, you can't get publicity like that. The sort of word of mouth genuine followers so what a, what a great moment for you yeah that was so a couple of quick questions to try and get some value from you because yeah, other so. people perhaps slightly behind where you are you're two years into doing your mailing list and so on yeah um what are your tips for people who've got the book but haven't really taken the next step uh so the the first tip would be um as a few people said is definitely get over that stigma of giving something away being a bad thing um my mailing list was literally 10 20 people when i started out I gave the first title of my series away, um, basically to say, you know, here's a taster, see what you think. If you like it, come back and buy the rest, and people do. But it's having that faith in sort of almost starting off on the back foot, in a way. Um, and, it, and, it's, and it's worked wonders. It's 
developed my mailing list to the point where that list is now a valuable resource for me and I can launch new books to an existing platform that, that puts it in a high enough chart you know, to be successful. Um, so definitely that is, that is one big tip, focus on the mailing list, don't be afraid to give something away because you'll get it back tenfold further down the line. Okay, with JV Shamari now. JV, just introduce yourself to me and tell me where you are and what you're doing. Um, I'm mostly a science writer. Um, I write articles for magazines and I, uh, I'm a Forbes contributor, so I write sort of short articles online, um, generally about popular science. Um, a couple of years ago, I decided to quit my job because I wanted to be a writer rather than... because I was a feast editor for a long time and I didn't want to be an editor, I wanted to be a writer. That's, that's why I got into the job in the first place. Um, and so that was one of the factors that sort of said, well, I should, I should, I should keep my, quit my job and try doing writing full time. It was very hard. So um, I started writing a book about um, basically the science of superheroes and why that's important. Um, and then uh, the money ran out, so I started going back to a bit of journalism. And in the meantime, I got commissioned to write another non-fiction book on popular science. Um, so I wrote that, and that was published last year on. Um, it was basically just a book on biology for, again, a general audience. And then, because I got some money from that and I've been in the journalism, now I've got enough to sort of go back to the book that I really wanted to write, which is this non-fiction book. And, and so that was a commissioned book, but your non The biology one's commissioned, and then this, this superheroes one is this one which is... I'd always sort of thought, oh, I'm going to self-publish it. Can but, I just uh, say, I think that's a fantastic tag for a book. Yeah, well. The science behind superheroes. I don't know how many yeah. times... I mean, if you there, there it, how many... Yeah, there, I mean, there are a couple of books that are like that, but they, don't, they tend to be... We were just chatting just beforehand uh, about how you either say it's, it's true or it's not, and I think that's very interesting. So um, I think it's more interesting to sort of focus on what is true and then use as a starting point to discuss other things. So basically what I'm, what I'm doing is looking at... Uh, the powers and the origins of superheroes and then making parallels with how you could actually save the world with those things. Okay, that um, Which is great. a little bit weird. Um, I think it's quite cool. I think it's um, really cool. Um, and where are you with the book? Finished? So or? the first draft is finished um, and I guess I'm kind of at the point where I'm just sort of like tidying up based on what sort of platform I'm going to publish it on. So I have never really liked traditional publishers and my experience with publishing with a traditional publisher hasn't been great um, and I'd always kind of intended self-publishing um, so now I'm kind of at the stage where I'm trying to work out which I should do and then doing a bit of research as to why I'm here to work out what I need to do. Um, well you to need to listen to a couple of podcasts. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, brilliant to talk to SPF students. Uh, we're back at the Amazon stand, which has sort of been our haunt, hasn't it, for the last uh, couple of days. And you like it here because your name is up in the lights. They've got, your, they've got a book cover of <laughs> yours there. My book is up there, yeah, exactly. So it's, it's, it's been very nice to call this home base. Yeah, um, and as we've said all the way through, and as Joe made the point as well earlier, it is sort of tucked away. Who knows whether this aspect of the book fair will separate at some point and become its own show or whether we'll continue to come back here. But for us, I think it's been important. I really hope from the podcast listening point of view, we've done a service to you in having those conversations that perhaps you would have had had you been able to get to London uh, and the other, other book fairs. Um, and definitely, I think, you know, from, from my point of view, writing my first novel, uh, I've learned loads about the next steps that I need to be taking. I, mean, I knew a lot about the marketing stuff, but the aggregating and stuff I was clueless about. Yeah, this is a great place to come for that kind of thing. And, you know, just to kind of um, underline that point about education and, and community, if you just look behind you, James, you've, you've got... Um, the authors have just come off the Amazon stand, so we've got um, Keith Houghton, uh, Rachel Abbott, LJ Ross. They did the uh, panel today, and they're just they're, they're all swamped with, with um, authors who want to pick their brains, and they're all answering questions. They'll be talking for another hour or two, probably. And that's exactly... What I love about this community, everyone is so friendly and collaborative and, and prepared to help. And just looking behind us now is a really good visual um, example of, of what that means. It's no snobbishness here at all, is no, it? No, at all. Not at all. OK, it's been brilliant. Thank you so much for listening to our two special podcasts live from the London Book Fair. We'll be back, of course, next Friday with a new podcast on self-publishing formula from Mark and myself. We'll say goodbye. Bye-bye, I'm going to bed. How about you? <laughs> uh, well, I went out with some SBS students last night, so I'm going to sleep in a corner. Cool. You've been listening to the Self-Publishing Formula podcast. 
Visit us at selfpublishingformula.com for more information, show notes, and links on today's topics. You can also sign up for our free video series on using Facebook ads to grow your mailing list. If you've enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next time. Oh,